Hello and welcome to worship with the First Congregational Church of Webster Groves. We are a member church of the United Church of Christ located in St. Louis, Missouri. This is our worship for Sunday, March 21st, 2021. Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent and also happens to be this year's vernal equinox, the first official day of spring. I'm your announcer, Phil Schulberg. I am joined in leading worship this morning by Pastor Dave DeNoon, pastoral assistant Hallie Kim, student pastor Merriman Boyd, and music director and organist, Dr. Leon Burke III. Our technical, our technical team this morning are Bob Bruda and Linda, Linda Capetti on sound, and Herb Niemeyer and I on camera. We are pleased to have you join us this morning in offering praise and prayer to God. To prepare for worship, I invite you to take a moment and concentrate on the rhythms of your body, your breath, your heartbeat, to quiet yourself so that you can pay attention to them. And to feel how these rhythms unite you with every other living thing on the planet as well as with the earth itself and its rhythms of night and day, light and shadow, stillness and activity. God's spirit is with us here, with me, and there with you. As the bell tolls and the candles are lighted, let our worship begin. The days are surely coming, says the Holy One, when I will make a new covenant with my people. It will not be like the covenant that I made before, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was wedded to them, says the Holy One. But this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Please join me in the raising of the covenant of our church. We who are called of God into this Christian community covenant together to seek to know the will of God, to experience the joy and struggle of discipleship, to proclaim in word and deed the love of Christ, and to work for peace and justice among all people. We trust God's promise of grace and forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our trials and rejoicing. Jesus, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and your servant will be healed. Let us confess our, our sins. Oh. 
salvation restore the joy restore unto me the joy of my salvation and the No longer shall my people teach one another or say to each other, Know the Holy One, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Yes, God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. Amen. My family and I used to live in a faraway land called Arizona. Coming from St. Louis, Arizona was very different from what we knew, and it took us a long time to get used to it. Cactuses instead of trees, rattlesnakes and scorpions instead of squirrels and bunnies, riding bikes in the winter and staying inside during the summer, it was very different. My son was four when we moved and he really missed St. Louis. He missed his grandma and his grandpa. He missed our old house and his old room. He missed his friend, Nick. But slowly over time, we all got used to Arizona and we even started to like it. My kids loved to play in the desert wash, and we loved going swimming from March through October. We loved the sunsets and seeing coyotes cross the road. We loved not having to wear coats over our Halloween costumes because it was still 100 degrees when we were going trick-or-treating. I loved voting at home in my pajamas and never dealing with daylight savings time. And my son made a new best friend named Dylan. And then he made another new best friend named Camden and another new best friend named Levi. Arizona became our home and our people. Even after so much sadness in leaving St. Louis, In fact, as soon as it started to feel really comfortable, we moved back here. I thought it was going to be easy to come back to St. Louis. After all, it was our first home and we had missed it so much, but it wasn't easy. My son missed Dylan and Camden and Levi. My daughter, who didn't remember St. Louis at all, missed her best friend Cecilia bitterly. We came back in the summertime and everyone was complaining about very minor heat. My husband and I had to get new jobs. 
We had to find a new house. Our kids had to start a new school. And it was a whole lot at once. It didn't feel like home, just like a lot of change and sadness. But the same thing that happened in Arizona happened to us again in St. Louis 2.0. Slowly, we started to love the things of St. Louis more than we missed the things of Arizona. And now my son is friends with Max and Jack and Tobias. And my daughter is friends with Charlotte and Jassie and Brindley. This has become our home and our people again. Sometimes when we lose something that we loved, it can feel like we'll be sad forever. We don't know how we can be happy again without the thing we've lost. But when we put a seed in the ground, it's not gone forever, is it? With time and water and sunshine, that seed will turn into a plant and later flowers and fruit. Jesus talked about how there is joy on the other side of pain and beginnings even after endings. Let's pray. Spirit, comfort us with the reminder that seeds turn into fruit. New places and new people can become as special to us as the places and people we leave behind. And what's sad and painful won't last forever because there's always a new beginning. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John. I will read the 12th chapter, starting at the 20th verse and end at verse 33. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the human one to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the parent will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Abba, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Abba, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake not for mine, for now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he would die. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, we would like to see you. Help us to have our attention drawn to where we might find you. Be with us in this moment. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. They weren't Greeks. The author of the gospel according to John called them Greeks. Indeed, Paul referred to the Gentiles, whom he addressed in his works as Greeks also. The Acts of the Apostles refers to an entire group of Christians as Hellenizers. They might well be a similar group to the one we're referring to here, because Hellenizers is just a fancy word for Christians who wanted to make Christianity more accessible to people who spoke Greek. We know that Judaism in the first century had become a religion interesting to those who had been brought up on Roman and Greek paganism. Imagine one God, one God to guide and assist you in everything, just one. But that one God clearly preferred a certain ethnicity, so one had to observe from the sidelines the way our confirmation classes observe worship of Jews today. But the people in question who asked to see Jesus probably weren't Greeks, not actually. They were probably just non-Jews who spoke Greek. Since the time of Alexander the Great, people throughout the Mediterranean and the lands to the east that Alexander had conquered or annexed, used a Greek dialect called Koine as their language for commerce. You remember how last week I cited a professor who acknowledged that common religion helped you to trust your trade partner? Well, a common language comes in pretty handy for that too. Probably Jewish by ethnicity and upbringing, the author of John, wanted to be clear to other Christians that the people who were approaching Philip were not Jews, but Gentiles, and therefore not the people whom Jesus would have been particularly disposed to approach. In the first century, the early second century, Christians would have known this. In fact, the people who were approaching Jesus, not only not being Greeks, they were probably Romans. In fact, they were probably wealthy Romans, well-placed Romans, significant Romans, traveling Romans, colonizers. And they seemed to Philip to be sufficiently suspicious that when they asked him if they could see Jesus, he was wary enough about their simple proposal to go first to his friend Andrew. Philip didn't so much as sidle in Jesus' direction to inquire of the rabbi whether he would want to see them. Don't miss the omen of Greek-speaking Romans, John seems to be telling us, and seems to be what Philip was thinking. Jesus doesn't miss the omen. When Andrew and Philip bring him the news of Gentiles wanting to see him, Jesus implicitly understands a few things. First, as Matthew's gospel states from the time of the arrival of the Magi in chapter 2 of that gospel, John now asserts that there will be a movement of loyal Gentiles paying their respects to the Nazarene rabbi. Jesus knew this. 
Next, the disciples delivering the news to Jesus are Jewish men with Greek names. Did you catch that? Andrew actually is Andreas in the Koine of the Bible and means simply human being. He approaches Jesus with Philip, literally Philippos, horse lover. Philos, hippos, horse lover, or significantly the name of the father of Alexander the Conqueror. The rest of Jesus' disciples in John are Simon, Shimon, James, Yaakov, John, Yohanan, Thomas, Thoma, two are named Judas, Judah, and then also Nathaniel, Nathanael. And all of these names were Hebrew in origin. So maybe at this point, we are at, don't miss the omen of Greek-speaking Romans introduced by Jews with Greek names. Pointedly, John and Jesus also are attuned to the notion that from its very beginning, Christianity is going to be blurring the lines between people. Because Jesus replies with a round of statements which seem at first like they're non sequiturs, but which we know. It is time for the human one to be glorified. Only after a grain of wheat is buried does it bear much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their life will keep it for eternal life. And those who follow me also are my servants, honored by God. Now, it is entirely likely that any of you who are listening to what I'm saying right now have been reading John all of your life. But even if you haven't, you know that these apparent non sequiturs have been strung together for a reason. They actually aren't a series of unprompted statements. What Jesus is telling Philip and Andrew here, and telling us who are reading, is that he is about to die, but that, as the manager of an inn where my wife and I spent a night in Scotland on our honeymoon, told us about a very expensive room, it's totally worth it. He's about to die, to suffer, to die, but it's totally worth it. Oh, I need to tell you a little bit about that room. It was not totally worth it. At least, not the room itself, but the evening we spent in the bar of that inn totally was. The manager was a young woman from Sussex in England, from Sussex in England. It's totally worth it. The bartender was a Canadian from Newfoundland. There was a white South African on a study visa. And we also met a lorry driver, Dave, from Leeds. There were a couple of Scottish locals blended in to top off the mix. The bed in our room, honestly, was just a bit too firm for comfort, and it did beg the question of the innkeeper's assertion. But those stories and that company that we met over dinner really were totally worth it. All of us spoke Something like English, Coco and me occasionally having to turn to another for something like translation. To this day, the two of us talk about that night. It's almost 22 years later, and we still remember it with such fondness. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say to you that the glorification that we have seen of Jesus through his suffering, death, and resurrection is anything that we ought to be comparing to something as mundane as an evening in a Scottish watering hole. And for as expensive as Christ's glorification finally turned out to be, it is fitting for us sometimes to look at it and wonder whether it was really worth the price, whether we really are worth the price. But think about it for a bit and you realize that the world didn't end with the resurrection of Jesus, even though the first Christians appear to have thought that it would. 
There have been billions upon billions of human beings who have occupied this earth since Jesus did, and there were millions and millions of them before he came along, and robust numbers of living creatures and planets, stars, and hidden reality among us, right along with us. So maybe the life of God, ruined, spent, and returned in the tiniest little corner of a vast universe, as a microcosm of the ordering of love and creation, really might be seen as totally worth it. I've spent other nights with lines blurred, haven't you? Where I suddenly had a feeling of the glorification that we're talking about here. We've sat together in meetings, worked together in pro- on projects, enjoyed common culture, reveled simply in being creatures, offspring of the source of existence we all share, where we've sat down with people of different faiths or different backgrounds, where we've sat down with loved ones. Because the omen of Greek-speaking Romans wanting to see Jesus and pleading with two Greek-named Jews to introduce them isn't ominous, it's promising. John here introduces us to the author's understanding of the blurring of lines, lines of human demarcation entirely impotent before God, a God who can make life spring up from out of certain death. The other evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all the prophets, would assert that this means God has won, and it's true. John says it means that the glorification of Jesus has begun, and that's true. Abba, glorify your name, Jesus Christ. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again, the voice from beyond replies. Like Alexander who made the Greek language so ubiquitous around the Mediterranean that 300 years later Jews were naming their children Philip and Andrew and colonizing Romans were speaking Greek rather than their native Latin in order to conduct commerce and government, our God has conquered. Our God, through Jesus, employed and continues to employ love to blur the lines that we have used to divide ourselves from others. Our God came, whose name itself, Yahweh, I am, reminds us of the very basis of existence, which is love, came and unsaddled us who presume to make our species unique in the cosmos or, or greater than all others. This God, glorifying the holy name by suffering and dying and rising again, has caused love to win, defying divisions, tearing down walls, preventing our presumption here in this little corner of the universe we have seen and known the truth. That we are built upon love. We have accepted John's testimony. We will perpetuate the principle. We are all God's children. We are all God's people. We are all God's creation. We are followers of Jesus and servants of that one. Following and serving the one who understood truly what glory means. We'll pay heed to the omen of Greek-speaking Romans and shall live the love that we have been shown and have known. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain, wheat that in dark earth for many days has lain. Love lives again, that with the dead has been. Love is come again, like wheat that rises green. 
Every Wednesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we meet on Zoom in order to be able to gather together the prayers that we have for the week. And this week, we have these prayers in addition to those that ordinarily we are praying that have become our regular prayer list. I'm not going to actually dictate the prayer list to you right now. I'm just going to uh, put it on the screen with me here and invite you to be praying for the causes and the people that are listed there. In addition to those, however, I do want to name those whom we uh, called to mind this week in our prayer gathering. We hold dear in our hearts our sister Jean as she uh, recovers from minor surgery this week and her daughter Laura, who had somewhat major surgery a few weeks ago, but is doing very well. We offer prayers for both of them in their healing. We pray for Bill and Laurel and Gavin and the challenges that they are experiencing right now, very much because of Bill's diagnosis with pancreatic cancer. I've also been asked to remember in prayer those who were killed in Atlanta this past week, um, especially holding in our hearts uh, people of Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, descent and um, origin. This has been a particularly difficult season for them, this season that has lasted for the last year as they have been subject to random violence and actually violence that wasn't so random, some race-based violence. We pray for our Asian American and Pacific Islander siblings as they find their way forward and we pray especially for the families of those killed in Atlanta this past week. With these prayers on our hearts and yet more that go unspoken this day, let us join our hearts together as we lift them to God in prayer. Blessed God, God of life, God of love, God of newness, God of power, on this first day of spring, we greet you with the words from Jesus fresh upon our hearts. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear much fruit. We think of that image and of the blessing of our gardens, of the environment around us, And glowing with the light that we have within us from last night's discussion about environmental justice, we continue our journey through creation here. 
We think also of the words that came to us from the gospel, according to John, about how strangers came to Jesus. And first to his disciples, asking to meet him, to see him. And we think of those who are watching now, who perhaps are less acquainted with our congregation, with those whom we will meet when we are back together again in May, visitors and newcomers and uh, tire kickers, folk who want to know more about who we are because of what they've seen. And as Philip and Andrew wondered themselves, how, how shall we be in dialogue together with these newcomers? How, how will we turn strangers into siblings? What shall we learn from one another? What new growth are you planning for us? Whom shall we become? This can set our hearts a a little bit at dis-ease, at at unrest. But we know that you are here with us. We know it is your Holy Spirit communicating Christ's good news to the world, perhaps even through us. And so, O God, We pray that your spirit would fill us with confidence as we come to new life together, all of us together. Be with us here as Christ probably sat down with Andrew and Philip had a long conversation with them about the, uh, the omen of Greek-speaking Romans and offered them the assurance that no matter where they went or whom they met, that he was there and would ever be there. Taught them that when they were together, that they ought to pray as he did, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By combining our gifts, skills, and abilities, we are enabled to do much together through our church. Your financial offerings to First Church are greatly appreciated. Some of you are aware of our current effort to increase our giving to the agencies and institutions we we support in their fulfillment of God's call upon us to seek justice and love kindness. Our goal this year is to raise $23,000 for our mission partners. So far, we've raised $12,487, so there's a little way to go, there's a little ways to go to reach our goal. We are asking you to open your heart and your pocketbook for our mission partners. In addition, we, are, we have a giving store with items that are still available for purchase. The money collected from the giving store goes to support the minister's discretionary fund used to provide since assistance to individuals and families in need. While the health crisis continues until it is safe again to pass plates or collect in person, we will be receiving monetary offerings only by mail or online. 
If you are able financially and you would like to support First Church with a monetary donation, please either send a check to First Congregational Church, 10 West Lockwood, Webster Groves, Missouri, 63119. You can indicate to which fund you would like your donation to go by writing either general fund or benevolence on the memo line. Or alternatively, go to our website, firstchurchwg.org, and to our donate page, using the pull-down menu there to direct and there to direct your gift. Thank you. And now let's have our prayer of dedication. God, there are many who wish to see Jesus. Our gifts might just make the Christ visible to others. In joy and celebration of the many gifts that we share, we ask you to bless all of our offerings. This we pray in the name of Jesus, your first in all the world. Amen. For the season of Lent, we have been talking about different kinds of covenants. We've been hearing readings about um, the covenant of God with Abraham, the covenant of God with Noah. This week, we heard Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God, who wants to write God's covenant upon our hearts, that God will be our God and that we shall be God's people. In our scripture, the gospel reading told us of some Gentiles coming and wishing to see Jesus. And I imagine that Jesus reminded Andrew and Philip of the importance of remembering that, as another apostle once said, by entertaining strangers or by welcoming strangers, some have entertained angels unawares. And so that is my reminder to you as we part this week, be on the lookout with God's word written upon your heart. Be mindful of those whom you meet and how they may have a word for you, a blessing to share, and that you, as a stranger to them, may bear the image of God and reveal the person of Jesus, so that they, like those Gentiles, those strangers so long ago, might become acquainted with the one whom they needed and whom they wished to see. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.
This is our worship for the week at First Church. We are glad you could worship with us. Please join us for our virtual coffee fellowship Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. The virtual coffee fellowship link is on the home page of our website. Please also plan to be with us this Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the evening when we conclude our weekly Lenten series, Webster Groves and African America. This week's topic is establishing equity today and onward. Join us as we consider together how much remains to be done for the sake of racial justice in our community and, the, and in our world. This afternoon, we have something very special planned. We will gather at a safe distances in our east parking lot for a filming of Jesus riding to, into Jerusalem on a donkey. This video will be used at the start of our Palm Sunday worship service. And here's just one more reminder, inviting you to contribute to our benevolences by mailing a check or giving electronically through our website. As for now, our worship has ended. Let our service begin. <laughs> 